All right, so starting back with the nervous system, extremely complex organ system in the body, uh, but also very, very important because it's what controls the all the other functions of the body. Now, without things like the respiratory or cardiovascular system, none of the other systems would live, but without the nervous system, pretty nearly all of the other systems would be existing on their own and would not be working together. So the nervous system really organizes um, the functions of the body, the physiology of the body. <clears throat> All right, so, uh, yep, 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 pretty clear, straightforward. All right, central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. A couple of different things to remember here. Central brain, brainstem, spinal cord. That's your central nervous system. Your peripheral nervous system is going to be all the nerves that come off the spinal cord. This, the cranial nerves that come off the brain are not always associated with the, the um, well, excuse me, they're, they're also associated with the peripheral nervous system. Now, with the peripheral nervous system, you have two sides. You have the somatic and the autonomic. The somatic is your voluntary control of muscles and actions and things like that. Whereas the autonomic nervous system is what's going to control your heart rate, your respiratory rate, your digestive system, uh, and along those lines. <clears throat> Within the autonomic nervous system, there we go. All right, visual for you. Am I? Oh, God, I'm an idiot. All right. There. Now you can see what I thought you were seeing this whole time. All right, so here we can see the breakdown of the nervous system where you have the peripheral and the central nervous system. And then within the peripheral, we see the autonomic and the somatic. Over here, what this is indicating is also using the peripheral nervous system to send signals into the body. So information from outside or information inside is processed through the body or in, received through the central nervous system and then actions are sent back out. Now, with the peripheral nervous system again, you'll have the somatic nervous system, and that is muscle control, voluntary activity, and things like that. And then you'll have <clears throat> the autonomic nervous system that has the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. And those two sides of the autonomic nervous system are constantly balancing each other out. It's like a tug of war as to which one is going to take over at the moment. And while neither particularly like the receptors and the activities of both don't overlap, the actions of one side can inhibit the actions of the other through a series of uh, steps. So the parasympathetic, this is your feed or breed, the rest and digest, this handles um, or shunts a lot of the blood to your intestinal organs, helps you uh, focus on, well, focuses your body on the absorption of nutrients, whereas the fight or flight, the sympathetic nervous system, that's going to slow down peristalsis, slow down gastrointestinal function, and increase blood flow to your muscles, uh, resulting in or also dumping epinephrine uh, to result in more energy and a higher blood sugar level, and so on and so forth. We have, I think I mentioned this the other day in stress, talked a little about that, about how stress results in the release of epinephrine and um, glucocorticoids that are designed to raise your blood sugar levels for the stress and to be able to be prepared to meet the stress. So that's the sympathetic nervous system taking over. And when it does that, that's, that's one of the aspects that can lead to, or is the reason stress can lead to heart attacks or it puts you at an increased risk of a heart attack at least, is that <clears throat> constant uh, higher levels of epinephrine and <clears throat> breakdown of fat in order to maintain blood sugar or uh, raise blood glucose levels uh, so are associated with the formation of an arthrosclerotic plaque in your arteries. So, anybody know what that organ in the very, sitting in front of the heart is? You recognize that? Uh, no, well... Okay, so the pericardium wraps around the heart, but that looks like, I don't know how to describe it, a uh, yellow, bumpily thing up above where the arteries are. It's actually the thymus. 
that it's uh, depicting there. <clears throat> Bumpily, real, real intelligent there, Bryce. Yep, real accurate word. All right, so talking a little bit more about the specific cell parts of the neurologic system and the ner nervous system, you'll have the neuroglial cells or neuralgia, but it's uh, neuroglia are <clears throat> and are the these are the non-neuron cells. These are supportive cells. These are the protective cells and. Uh, we're not going to get deep into what those all do, but like, for example, earlier I mentioned that there are special nervous system cells that work like a white blood cell that protect you or protect your body and your, your brain. That would be these microglial cells. <clears throat> All right, so your neurons, uh, we brought this up in the quiz, or this got mentioned in the quiz earlier today. What is a neuron? Neurons have three major parts of the body. So the neuron is the most fundamental cell of the nervous system. In the brain, these neurons are rather small because their axons and dendrites are not very long. The adjoining nervous system, uh, neurons are very close to it. But a neuron can actually have a very long uh, axon while it continues out to another cell somewhere else in the body. <clears throat> So they can extend a very long distance through your body. So the dendrite, those are appendages that bring signals into the cell. And then the axon is the appendage that takes signal out of the cell. A cell can have multiple dendrites, but generally speaking, they will only have one axon. They will only send the signal out in a specific direction. So um, now there are cells that are, that um, don't have dendrites and there's and so on and so forth or there's cells that only have one dendrite So this is a good picture here to kind of show you some of the pieces and parts up in the top corner of the uh, Graphic you can see the, the where it says motor neuron You see the main cell body kind of looks like a fried egg with the yolk in the middle That's the nucleus and the shape of that cell is a uh, there is very little excess space. Uh, most of the space in the cell is taken up with the Golgi apparatus and the mitochondria in order to produce energy so that it can create its neurotransmitters to then send to another location. So there's very uh, uh, little extra room. So glucose and oxygen don't get stored in there. It doesn't have large proteins like the muscles do, myoglobin, to store oxygen in the cell. And that's why it needs that constant supply of glucose and oxygen. So you can see the dendrites being brought in here, uh, bringing the signal in. This one has a whole lot of dendrites. And then you have the axon that extends out. And what is that that is wrapped around the axon? What can you see in that image there? Yes, that is the myelin sheath. And you can see the neurons from that. If you look on page 294 in your textbook, there is a cross section of a, a nerve cell in image C. Um, and that is showing the what the axon looks like with the myelin sheath wrapped around it. It is another cell with a membrane that wraps kind of like a pig in a blanket um, around that uh, axon. And generally speaking, your same, if you looked back on page 293, you see the oligodendrocytes. Those are the kind of cells that create the myelin sheaths. And when they reach out to it, they wrap around the cell in that way. And that's how they transmit the signal. So once we, we have the myelin sheath that wraps around the axon and then that axon branches out so that it has multiple points of innervation that to innervate is to connect a nerve to a, a muscle or something. And so you can see in that image, it has multiple points of connection with the muscle. So it's not only stimulating one point um, by stimulating large areas of the muscle, it can create a more 
um, organized contraction. Here we, in the, in the uh, zoomed in on the graphic, we can see the end of the axon, which is called the synaptic bulb. And it's full of these little synaptic vessels. These are basically they've broken off from the Golgi apparatus and they're full of the hormones, the neurotransmitters that that neuron produces. If this was a muscle cell, those neurotransmitters would likely be acetylcholine. If this was a nerve cell communicating with another nerve cell, that neuro neurotransmitter could be norepinephrine or dopamine or serotonin or... Um, melatonin or something like that i'm sorry do you have a question i'm gonna go with no all right so um what they're showing here and you can see the little indentations along the right side of the synaptic bulb that is where the vesicles will move for uh, move to the edge to the cell membrane of the synaptic bulb and then open join with that cell membrane releasing their neurotransmitters into what's called the synaptic cleft where they can then bind to the neurotransmitter interestingly enough uh, those recept uh, those transmitters, if they aren't bound or after a short period of time, the axon can reabsorb them back in to the cell and be ready to use them again. Other sometimes they are consumed or they're broken down by enzymes that are present in the synapse and such, and <clears throat> then their pieces and parts are used to rebuild other transmitters in the future. If you've ever heard of the medication Zoloft or Prozac, these are SSRIs, which is Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors. So the, those neurotransmitters, when they're released, like if this was nerve to nerve, that would be, could be serotonin being released from one nerve to the next. They would release it into the cleft, the, the cell would release the neurotransmitter into the cleft, the synaptic cleft. If and it leaves it there for a short period of time to be able to bind to and create the signal, carry on the signal to the next cell in the dendrite of the next cell. And then after that period of time would reabsorb back into the synapse through uh, reabsorption, uh, reuptake gates. Well, if your body doesn't produce enough serotonin, in the time frame is the same, it releases it and then reabsorbs it, reuptakes, you're not going to have the effect that it's supposed to because there wasn't enough quantity of serotonin to bind to all the receptors to create the intended effect. So what an SSRI would do is prevent the reabsorption of that neurotransmitter, um, leaving it in the synaptic cleft longer to be able to um, accomplish its goal, or excuse me, in order to allow the neurotransmitter to do its job. This would is why a medication antidepressant like serotonin um, SSRIs work, they don't cause you to produce more serotonin. They don't give you a euphoric or a um, analgesic type feeling. They allow the neurotransmitters that are already produced by your body to have a longer action time to be able to work more efficiently or, um, or more effectively, excuse me, allows them to work more effectively by leaving them in the synaptic cleft longer. So, now um, we didn't talk about this, or, or the video talk in the muscle video talked about this a little bit. So I wanted to point it out again. Do somebody explain to me the function of the T tubule? We haven't heard from you guys in a little while, Roswell. So tell me about the T tubule. What is it? What you? What did you catch in the video earlier today? part of the body. Great place to start. Grabs on the muscle fibers. All right. So um, it does continue down inside the muscle fiber. And what I'm going to here, I'm going to switch to a different image real quick or, and let you see this. Let me switch this to whiteboard. All right, so 
I'm a horrible artist. Please don't be mad at me. But what does this kind of look like to you? Do you really want us to answer this question, sir? <laughs> uh, uh, Y'all a bunch of jerks. Y'all a bunch of jerks. Hey, you children. Right oh yeah, is the yeah. toddler still here? Yes, the toddler's still here. All right, so. Maturity out of us, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Oh, well, good. I'm in good company then. All right, so this is supposed to be a hand grenade, it is not a ball sack. And what I'm trying to show you here is how the fuse on a hand grenade works. If you're in the, if you spent time in the military, you're probably familiar with this already, but we're all somewhat familiar with the fact that the there's a ring and a pin on a hand grenade. You pull the pin <clears throat> and then it flips this part off. And this is the, which releases the trigger, the hammer fires and it starts burning a fuse on the inside. And that fuse is shielded, shrouded and goes all the way into the center of the hand grenade. So then when it detonates, it detonates the explosive from the middle out, causing it to blast in all directions equally Otherwise, it would create a shape charge and just like blow off in one end. But this creates the explosion that travels in all directions equally. So it, it sends the signal all the way to the center of the hand grenade. Now delete that because you perverts can't you know, pay attention. All right, so back to the nervous system, the T-tubule works kind of like that uh, fuse on the hand grenade. It carries the, the neurotransmitter signal all the way down into the middle of the cell so that it can spread out the signal faster and create the activation of the SR, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which what, what is stored in the SR? What did the video say? It's on the screen too, but what what's stored in the SR? Golden Triangle, you guys are being quiet today. What's stored in the SR of the muscle cells? Calcium. Calcium, yes. Thank you. So the T tubule allows the signal, the depolarization signal, to travel quicker to the a larger portion of the SR and release that calcium more rapidly so that the entire cell is firing instead of the cell um, firing from one side only, and then you only get a partial muscle contraction. All right, so here's that cross section I was talking about, uh, how the myelin sheath forms around the axons. You can see the axon there and all of the vesicles of, of the chemical and the nodes of Ranvar. These are the sections between the myelin sheath. So what happens is instead of the signal having to... So you're all familiar with the wave, like in a stadium where somebody on one side starts it and then everybody starts jumping up all the way around the stadium. That's essentially how the depolarization of a cell works through the cell. It starts at one point and continues in a wave of depolarization along the length of the cell. Now, when you're talking about a muscle cell or a heart, heart muscle cell or something like that, the cell is relatively short, so it travels to the next cell pretty quick. But when you're talking about an axon on a nerve, which could be quite long, that could take quite a while for the signal to pass all the way through, and we want instant reaction. So the, um, the myelin sheath causes or creates the ability for that signal to um, skip, like leapfrog along the um, axon. So instead of the signal passing slowly like a wave through the entire axon, it jumps from one node to the next uh, as a result of the myelin sheath. 
and that causes the signal to move down the axon much faster. And that's why you'll find myelin sheaths on motor neurons in the peripheral nervous system, but uh, motor and sensory, excuse me, but it, you'll find them on peripheral nerves, but not central nervous system nerves like the spinal cord and brain. That's why multiple sclerosis does not affect the um, brain or the muscle, uh, the spinal cord, but it re affects the peripheral nervous system. <clears throat> Right, we've already kind of talked about the synapse a little bit. All right. All right. So what it's talking about here with the neurotransmitters being excitatory or inhibitory. So in a muscle cell, if a nerve sends a signal and releases a neurotransmitter, the neurotransmitter is almost always acetylcholine and that acetylcholine is going to excite the cell. It's going to cause action to happen. It's going to make the cell depolarize and function. Incidentally, there's another nerve that releases acetylcholine on another muscle that has a very different effect. The vagus nerve carries or runs from the brain down to the, um, excuse me, it's a cranial nerve and it goes to the heart and terminates in the area of the SA node. When it releases acetylcholine, instead of activating the SA node and causing it to depolarize, it actually inhibits depolarization. It reduces the frequency at which the SA node will fire. So the actions of acetylcholine on the heart are inhibitory, where the actions of acetylcholine on your biceps are excitatory. And that's why like rubbing, uh, doing a carotid massage, which will stimulate the vagus nerve, can slow the heart rate down because it's releasing acetylcholine onto the heart. What is a medication that we could give that would stop or slow neurotransmission? neurotransmission? Anybody know? Anybody think of a, a medication that they've heard of being used to prevent neurotransmissions? Say again? I've got an antagonist. Okay, it would be an antagonist, yes, but uh, I was going more specific, like the actual medication name. Adderall. I don't think Adderall is. Um, what it, My understanding of what Adderall does is actually increases the level of excitation in order to um, make it easier for you to focus by ex um, speeding things up a little bit. Adderall? So Ativan will, Ativan works at the central nervous system and depresses function and slows the action of neurotransmission. One of the ones I was thinking of is acetylcholine. It's a paralytic. It stops the transmission and the communication between the nerve and the muscles by binding to the receptors on the muscles and not allowing them to receive any further signal. And so it interrupts and stops all that neurotransmission. But, uh, how long? I'm not as familiar with the function of it, so I can't, I don't want to speak to it. I don't know the specifics, uh, mechanisms of Haldol very well. Atropine is another one that will um, slow the effects of neurotransmission on the heart. If you give a patient atropine, it will bind to the receptors at the SA node, preventing the acetylcholine from binding to it and uh, decrease the effect of the uh, vagus nerve stimulation. So allowing the heart to return to its previous rate. All right, so these are all the different protective mechanisms. That's great. We can protect our central nervous system. A lot of students will get this part confused, so I wanted to point out to you, you have the layers of the um, brain, you have the um, meninges, 
where you have the dura and then the arachnoid and the pia matter and those are your um, meninges so the dura matter is on the outside the pia matter is on the inside one way to think of that is dirt d is before p so d comes first so you'll find the dura matter first another way is if you can remember high school biology or something if you ever uh, observed the dissection of a brain like you get to cut up a, a sheep brain or something the dura matter uh, is very thick and it's uh, stiff like parchment paper and so dura it durable it's a heavier thicker uh, tissue so if you, you can remember that but D before P um, when going into the brain D the um, dura matter is found first All right, I mentioned the blood-brain barrier earlier, so I'm not going to talk too much about that. All right, so this is some general locations within the heart. Or excuse me, yeah, the heart. Yeah, this is totally the heart. Um, within the brain, so we got the hypothalamus here in the uh, center of the brain, uh, and the thalamus. Those make up the diencephalon. This is where the connection between your um, endocrine system and your nervous system takes place, uh, specifically in the hypothalamus. But that's where it, that part of the brain actually produces and stores neurotransmitters or hormones that work locally that then go into the pituitary gland and release uh, hormones from the pituitary gland. And those hormones control the majority of the functions throughout the whole body all right here's the brain you can see the brain stem built with the pons and the medulla in the midbrain and that's where most of your vital functions take place the um ability to breathe the control of your blood pressure respiratory rate and such like that are all controlled there the cerebellum is going to control it is sometimes referred to your athlete's brain it's going to kind of have be the accelerometer everybody knows what an accelerometer in your phone is it's what tells whether it's moving or if it's a rotated up or down and when to uh, change the screen the cerebellum kind of does that in a way it controls your balance it knows where you are uh, your body position and then functions with a lot of your um finer uh, motor functions now your actual control of your motor functions are handled in the up um in the prefrontal cortex and that's where the the signals are sent from but the cerebellum plays a big role in communicating with that with that portion of the body now the uh, we already talked about the meninges, the cerebrum. This is the large portion of the brain up above on, on the top of the head, the one that we normally think of when we see the brain. And let's see what else do we need to talk about here. We will spend a lot more time talking about the brain in um, when we get to head trauma and neurology. So just kind of introducing it here all right so with the uh, thermoregulation uh, hypothalamus plays a big role in that it's when it's um, too hot or too cold and it tells you to shiver or sweat uh, it's interesting when you have a when you get sick and prostaglandins are released in your body as part of the inflammatory response system one of the functions of those prostaglandins is to reset the temperature on the hypothalamus. So if our body is supposed to be 98.6 degrees, that's what our hypothalamus thinks we're at all the time, or, you know, it's, it's trying to keep us that. Well, the prostaglandins will get to the hypothalamus and tell it, oh, no, 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 you're not at 98.6. You need to be higher. And it'll, you know, change that thermostat level to 100 or 102 or something like that. And then the hypothalamus thinks, oh, normal is 102. All right, let's start shivering. Let's start producing heat. We are cold. We need to get this temp up. Four degrees, people, let's go. And that's why you start to feel chilled and you feel cold and you shiver and you wanting to be covered in blankets when actually your fever is up and you're hotter than normal but then when your fever breaks you're sweating profusely and such like that because your hypothalamus has suddenly decided oh wait we're not supposed to be 102 we're supposed to be 98 everybody cool down and you start sweating and relieving all that heat from your body so your fever is actually caused by the hypothalamus being reprogrammed 
All right, so this is showing the limbic system, and this is one of the major controls between the lower functions of the brain and the higher functions of the brain, where you're, uh, we've already kind of talked about how it the hypothalamus controls the endocrine and M connects to the endocrine system. Um, and a lot of your sensory function is processed and filtered through this area. Um, so you can see it also com uh, talks about the emo not emo not emotion, but memories, short and long term memories, and how a memory is maintained because the senses pass through this, whether it's smell or sight or touch. That is why if you're trying to remember something or learn something, you have to make it associate with another sense, a sound, a smell, a taste, a feel. And then that sense or smell, that's whatever receptor, sense receptor that was, will cause you to make or have that memory. So if you always associated your grandmother's house with the smell of apple pie, well, every time you have uh, uh, smell apple pie, you think of your grandmother then. That's the limbic system making that connection. Now, the spinal cord actually plays a major role in protecting us. The majority of a peripheral nerve system signals are received by the spinal cord, processed, and actions are sent back out uh, to the motor nerves before the signal even gets to the brain. That's why oftentimes you will put your hand out and touch something hot and then move your hand back really quick. Um, you'll, your hand will jerk back and then you'll feel the pain or realize it hurts. And that's because there was a delay between the nerve signals making it to your spinal cord and reacting. So that's why you pulled your hand away. But then it gets to your head and you remember uh, and you realize, oh, that hurt. Um, and so your spinal cord recognized the pain and created a reaction before your brain recognized it. Have you ever heard um, somebody use the expression, think with your head? Um, it has different implications depending on the circumstances, but in one way, when, when you're in a fight or flight scenario, the majority of your actions, like your ability to run or function or whatever, are actually being controlled by your spinal cord. And so the maintaining control and keeping your head about you, using your head to think is where you get that higher function of decision making versus the reactive function of like like essentially the term knee jerk reaction of what your spinal cord would tell you to do versus what do you think about your action type of thing. All right, um, already named these nervous systems. So talked about where they are. We're not gonna get into spinal nerves and plexuses today. You don't have to memorize the cranial or name the cranial nerves for this portion of the class. And you can find all kinds of mnemonics online for how to remember the cranial nerves. So I uh, mentioned the autonomic nervous system earlier, and here you can see a breakdown of the functions of it where, you, where they are balancing each other out with the fight or flight and the rest and digest of how the signals are sent between the two from the same, um, signals are being sent to the same organs from two different sides of the nervous system to balance, creating that balance. What do you guys remember from EMT school? What creates our heart, or not creates, what um, influences our heart rate? What causes our heart rate to speed up? Adrenaline. Adrenaline. And what's another name for adrenaline? Epinephrine. Epinephrine, yep. Epinephrine and norepinephrine are neurotransmitters that play a major role in our heart rate. Our heart will beat at a set rate, 60 to 100 at rest, at normal. And then when the brain feels like it's not getting enough blood flow, norepinephrine is released. When you walk around the corner and see the bear, epinephrine is released and it jacks your heart rate up significantly to combat that um, or to meet the need. 
Whereas when your brain's like, whoa, this, this heart rate is too fast, this blood pressure is too high, this is too much, it stimulates the vagus nerve to secrete the acetylcholine, which slows the, vag the SA node down, slowing the heart rate down. All right. Um, don't need to get too into the sensory function um, of all these different receptors. Um, maybe let's let's look at this. Um, <clears throat> I never saw no CO come up anywhere. Thermo receptor, thermo heat temperature. Um, mechanical uh, mechano receptors again physical movement that's um, proprioceptors so proprioceptor is a hard one you will see propri um, perception and all you'll see that term later on uh, especially when we get to neurology so that's a awareness proprioception is the awareness of where your body is so proprioceptors are what's telling our brain that my arm is at my side or that my arm is out and extended it makes you aware of your surroundings it makes you aware of where your the parts of your body are baroreceptors baro meaning pressure like barometric pressure a barometer so baro is pressure and then chemo is a chemical so most of those are pretty clear what they're talking about nocio and proprio are the only ones that seem less common so, but proprio is your position all right not going to get into the senses of smell and taste today uh, we will look at the eyes in more de um, depth later but you can see the um, general features here. Um, and this is the optic nerve that the, that is what transmit vision to our brain, uh, not the motor of the eye. It's not the motor nerves. There is your malleus incus and stapes, showing those three bones right there. And mass-wise, I think it's the stapes that is considered the smallest when it comes to mass. This is a very important function of the ear, and we will see this a lot. We'll actually run a lot of calls related to this. The, uh, let's go back, here it is. All right, so looking at the inner ear, you see at the top it says inner ear, and that is the cochlea and the semicircular canals. This is, this, the cochlea is where the sound is received. That's the, um, the perception of sound through there but the semicircular canals those are truly the gyroscope of our head those are what tell us if we're sitting upright if we're turning to the left if we're turning to the right if we're moving forward or back because there's fluid in those uh, canals and little cilia little hair-like structures that as the fluid moves it stimulates them back and forth and so when a person has an inner ear infection if there's pressure uh, on that or pressure on that nerve it can cause dizziness. If there's lack of blood flow there, it'll cause dizziness. Go ahead, Macon. I was just gonna say, like, I can totally relate. I had one so bad in high school one time that I was effectively stumbling around like I was drunk. It was not fun. The inner, the inner ear infection. Mm -hmm. So that's a um, there's a disease that causes this without the infection that we see a lot. People, go, oh, I'm so dizzy. Um, my blood pressure must be low. I'm puking like crazy. And, oh, I must be having a heart attack. No, actually, you have vertigo. Vertigo is that sudden feeling of dizziness, and it's normally a f something to do with the semicircular canals in the ear. Meniere's disease is vertigo on steroids. It is a severe case of vertigo, and it's treated with uh, seasickness medications. Normally, ear infections, we're going to treat with the antibiotics. Tubes in the ear relieve the pressure, that kind of a thing. But vertigo and Meniere's are going to get seasickness medications that will reduce the sensitivity to stimulation so that hopefully the patient won't feel as sick. Let me tell you this, if you're dealing with a patient with vertigo or Meniere's, Zofran is not going to cut it, and you'll be lucky if Phenagrin cuts it. I know when I had it, it was rough. Literally, the room was spinning. Does anybody carry Phenagrin? Not anymore. That's a bummer. Fenugrin's an amazing medication. 
Sometimes we're in the, we might be in the hard spot. Sometimes it can be pretty from the medical scary. All right. So now the endocrine system. The endocrine system is extremely complex. It's a really interesting system that covers, um, that controls a lot of the body, but it is a very complex, uh, well, it seems rather complex. Frankly, the immune system is the one that's horrible, um, horribly complex. So let's look here and talk a little about some of the different such sections of the endocrine system. So I mentioned earlier the hypothalamus, which is the neural um, endocrine bridge. It's the connection between the nervous system in the endocrine system up here in the top of the brain and then you can see the penile gland at the back side of the brain the penile gland is responsible for the secretion of melatonin predominantly which helps control your sleep schedules um, the hypothalamus has the an uh, connects to the pituitary gland which has the anterior and posterior pituitary and there are had historically been called the master gland because they will release uh, hormones through the rest of the body. That majority of them are going to go to other endocrine organs, not, or other endocrine glands, not specifically to other tissues. Now, things like growth hormones and um, will go directly to like bone and muscle to cause the growth, but follicles, uh, same with follicle stimulating hormone, but thyroid stimulating hormone, um, adrenocorticotropic hormone, or uh, luteinizing hormones, these are all going to go to other um, endocrine glands causing them to function. And then you have your thyroid, which is in the neck, right at the thyroid cartilage, where your Adam's apple is, per se. And then below that, you have the uh, behind it is the parathyroid, a very, very small gland. It actually is, looks like it's part of the thyroid, but it's very small location on the par on the thyroid gland. The thymus is at the base of the trachea where the trachea splits to go into the right and left main stem bronchi. And the thymus plays a huge role in the immune system. It is a endocrine gland, but it's mostly intended for the typing of T cells. You may have heard of T cells with the immune system. They are typed in the thymus. That's why they're called T cells. The other immune cell is the B cell. Those are uh, matured in the bones. Uh, in addition to that, we'll have the pancreas and the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands sit on top of the kidneys like a scoop of ice cream, and the pancreas lays behind the stomach between the kidneys. Um, we'll talk more here in a minute about their um, functions. And then the gonads for the male and the female. <coughs> All right, um, so a hormone is, a, excuse, well, let's back up. So what we're talking about chemical messengers here is neurotransmitters are going to be chemicals released by a nerve that will target a tissue directly adjacent to it. A hormone is going to be released by a gland or an organ, travel through the bloodstream to find its target tissue that way. So in general, a hormone is going to take longer to cause the effect than a, a neurotransmitter would. Ions function that same way, growth factors, these are all different types uh, that work similar to hormones. So these are various um, chemical messenger systems. All right, uh, let's see. Don't need to get into that right now. I already talked about that. Um, all right, paracrine and autocrine, as you can see, this is a chemical messenger. These are, they're like hormones. Um, they're in many ways very similar, but the autocrine are going to be released by a cell and act on the same cell, whereas the paracrine are going to act on a different type of cell. So one cell makes it and sends it to another cell autocrine just act at the same location without having to travel. Now, when we get to medications and pharmacology, we'll talk more about agonists and antagonists. Somebody brought that up a minute ago. Hormones can act in that way too. They can either antagonize an action, preventing an action from happening, or they can agonize an action, cause that action to happen. The majority of them, of them are the proteins, but some of them are steroid. Um, incidentally, 
uh, protein, protein polypeptide, am amine hormones, these are all very susceptible to um, enzyme action and acid um, and pH denaturation. denaturation. So you, have you ever met somebody, well, if you know, people who are diabetic have to take insulin, but they can only take the insulin via injection because if they were to take insulin via a pill, the stomach acids and the pepsin and then the other pancreatic enzymes that break down proteins would destroy the insulin and you would have no absorption of the insulin. And this is the case for many of the similar protein-based uh, hormones. That's why they can't be absorbed or through oral medication have to be taken as an injection. I thought they were working on a pill-based insulin though. Um, if they are, which they may be, and it's, it's very possible, they would what they would be doing is shielding it with um, in some way to prevent it from being susceptible to the enzyme action of pepsin and all that, but also be less receptive to a, uh, to, excuse me, to the function of acid. So what it would probably be is what's called a proenzyme, where it's not the f full, or it's not a proenzyme, that's different, it's similar, but it's the concept that it's not the full protein yet, and it'll be converted to the actual protein once it gets to the destination site. Uh, all right. Um, I talked about negative feedback earlier when we were looking at homeostasis, um, so I think we covered that. I've mentioned prostaglandins a couple of times. We'll talk about prostaglandins a lot more in the immune system, but prostaglandins are a type of hormone that are function with the re uh, inflammatory response system. So here you can see they cause platelet ag aggregation, they cause vascular permeability, and they we, I mentioned they can cause your uh, temperature to rise. They're also what causes a lot of the pain um, during a, you know, after an injury. And that's why a medication like Tylenol, which blocks prostaglandin formation, causes pain relief <clears throat> because the prostaglandins can't cause that irritation. It also treats fevers because it prevents the prostaglandin formation, which prevents the formation of the fever or the action of the fever. So in case anybody wondered, you uh, you don't cure the illness through the uh, application of Tylenol. Tylenol just blocks the fever, which was the body's uh, way of treating the illness. And so you're in, in effect preventing your body from healing itself. Now, occasionally the fever gets so out of control that you have to block it and control it in order to not damage other organs. All right, so here's the pituitary gland. We talked, I mentioned that earlier with the anterior and posterior. Here's all the different functions of the pituitary gland. You don't have to have them all memorized right now. Um, but as you can see here with the anterior pituitary gland, the majority of those hormones are going to other endocrine organs, um, whereas only a few of them are actually going to directly to tissue to function. All right, thyroid gland plays a huge role in your metabolism. High, uh, more thyroid, higher the metabolism. Less thyroid, lower the metabolism function. And um, the parathyroid, uh, well, the cal calcitonin here is what maintains your um, calcium levels. I don't know why that, it's like I'm looking at it right here, calcium. So the calcitonin is going to help maintain the calcium levels where the parathyroid gland will also do that. Calcitonin will remove the calcium from your bones where the parathyroid hormone will push the, um, no, it's other, other way around. Parathyroid hormone will pull the calcium out of your bones so that you can use calcium in your body. The calcitonin will put push it into your bones to store it for later. And so they balance each other out. Um, if you didn't have your parathyroid gland, you would run out of calcium in your blood and you would eventually die um, from a lack of calcium. This was a big issue that they had um, when they first figured out how to 
treat thyroid problems like goiters and cancer, thyroid cancers by removing the thyroid. Um, they didn't realize there was the parathyroid on the back of it, and they would do the surgery, everything would be great, and then the patients would randomly die a couple of weeks later without advent of chemistry they were or you know without full understanding of chemistry they didn't know what was going on it took them a while to realize oh look there's this other gland and it's really important i already talked about the thymus pancreas we know it as far as an endocrine organ it has the um, islets of langerhan which produce the insulin and glucagon those are the primary uh, hormones that we think about there. Somatostatin is also produced in the pancreas, but those are the hormones. Not, those are the endocrine functions of the pancreas. It has a whole lot of other function too. Here's the adrenal glands sitting on top of the kidney. You have the adrenal medulla and the adrenal cortex, and those secrete glucocorticoids, corticosteroids, and then your Adrenaline comes from the term adrenal gland. Epinephrine is adrenaline. That's where it comes from. And then you have the gonads, testes in men and ovaries in women. I already talked about the penile gland. And so this gets into the circulatory system. Uh, before we go there, let's take a quick break. 